Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson, and you're watching my 100% walkthrough for The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword for Nintendo Wii. This is the second half of the Fire Sanctuaries. If you haven't seen the first half, then refer to the previous video. But we are now at the third bridge in the main room, I believe is the which bridge we are on. Um, and as you approach, there is several Bokoblin across the way. Now I think, I know at least one of these, the upper one is a, an archer. I think all of them are actually though. So if you start trying to go across using the nearby target, they'll probably shoot at you. So I recommend you shoot at them from a distance using the bow. And then if you want to get across quickly or jump down because there is a Bokoblin archer up above, like up right above directly where you were. So it will, as soon as you get move forward a little bit, it'll start shooting at you. So just be warned about that. Um, and to one side on this lower platform, there is actually some blessed butterflies, which indicates the location of a goddess wall. Now, you can draw a Triforce, which is the, which will lead to fairies. I don't actually need any more fairies, so I'm not worried about it. So instead, I'm gonna draw some rupees. Um, it feels a little weird, like sometimes this drawing, like if, even if it's messy, like it, sometimes I get a lot of rupees. I think this time I get a lot. Um, but anyway, it feels a little bit, I'm unsure like quite what makes it work good. I think what it is is the points that you end the path on. So as long as you're kind of like, imagine little invisible dots. And if you hit them correctly, with the uh, this glowing sword, then you'll get a certain number of rupees. I think that's what decides how well you do it. So it doesn't matter. Like I think technically, if you hit the first point and then you just go woohoo all over the place, and then, <laughs> but you still manage to hit all those little checkpoints. I think you'll still get the max amount of rupees. Is I think how that works. But yeah, drawing on the goddess walls is super awkward. It's like I don't even know. It just like doesn't feel good. It feels like we're drawing on the inside of a bowl or something like that. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel flat, you know. So you're trying to draw on a flat surface in game, but your your surface you're drawing on in real life is like curved. So it's it's very strange feeling. And because of that though too, some areas of the bowl like move more suddenly than others. So even though you're drawing at the same pace, it like all of a sudden jerks to one side or what I don't know, it just doesn't feel very good. Um, it's okay, like, it's manageable, but it just is really awkward. I think, honestly, if they had more emphasis on the drawing aspect of this game, it would probably would be pretty aggravating, because it's just, like, for a small side thing, it's not really that big a deal. But, yeah, if it was, like, a primary thing, it would probably be more obnoxious. Um, anyways, continuing onwards, you want to continue on towards the east and work your way up using the claw shots, and once you get across, you'll find this another room with another magma in it. <laughs> So in this room, you'll see that there's actually a soft soil location off to one side near all these gates, and that one would just leads to some recovery hearts. So it's just temporary, but I'm just commenting that once you complete this next puzzle, you won't be able to access that. So you might want to go grab some of those now if you want those recovery hearts. Anyways, you want to go dig into the other hole, and this will lead to an area with multiple gates. You want to go ahead and smack the first switch, and which is the one to the south, and or if you just follow the right wall. Sometimes these holes, like as you're doing them, they will actually like rotate the room that you're crawling around in. It's very confusing, super disorienting. I don't know why they do it that way. They should just keep it the same orientation no matter which direction you come in from. So if you exit through the north and you re-enter, then that is still north, but sometimes it flips it around. Just so confusing because, I mean, I don't know, I guess it's like that for the rest of the game though, because you can Z target to turn your direction. So it doesn't stay based on compass direction. I don't know, whatever. It's just confusing to me. Anyways, you want to maneuver your way to the north and this time, or like continue going counterclockwise, I guess, and uh, hit the next switch to move both the gates. Once you exit the hole now, this will move the gates around, which allows you to reach a, an area with some water bulbs. And by the way, if you mess up, then I, I believe these water bulbs, if memory serves me correctly, they just regrow after a second. I guess I, I guess I just haven't missed on these for a long time, but um, otherwise, if it doesn't work, I'm sure they will regrow if you leave the room and come back. So if all else fails, that's another option too, but I'm pretty sure they just regrow on their own after a second. Um, here, for some reason, I was thinking I had to use Z and A, but you just swing the Wiimote to uh, throw the water bulb. So once you've gained access to this room, there is a lever on the wall that you can pull just by running up it or by using the whip, and this will lower the magma, which will then reward you with a uh, chest, which has the dungeon map. Now, as with all of the dungeons in Skyward Sword, the dungeon map is actually fairly useful, and this one gives you a clue about how to proceed. And in fact, one of the magmas here will talk about, uh, give you that clue much more pointedly too, just to make sure you know. But cool fi fact for you as well is, just about any of the Zelda games too, if you slash the wall with your sword, it will make a different sound if it's bombable. Um, I didn't actually show that in this particular video, and I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's true in this as well, but yeah, you can slash the wall and it will sound different, and that's another way you can, uh, if you suspect a wall is bombable, that's one way you can tell. 
Now, as usual in these dungeons, though, if you already know where to go, you don't actually have to get the dungeon map. It's just a little bit weird in this particular instance because Bronzy is, uh, needs help anyway. So you can help him if you want to, but I think you can actually just avoid him. If you don't rescue him immediately, I think he just yells at you after a little bit. If you <laughs> just continuing on, if you just blow up the wall and start walking away from him, I think he'll just call out to you and stuff. But I don't think it actually forces you to rescue him. I think you can just continue on and it doesn't matter. So once all of the dialogue is finally done, you can use your map to see that there is a hidden room that is connected to this one. And so you want to blow up that wall, and this will lead to a soft soil location that allows us to continue. And as long as we're waiting, I'm trying to get a recovery heart from the nearby jar, but uh, they just had rupees instead. So in this underground area, we have our first underground enemy, and this is a Moldor. Now these enemies have been seen in a lot of different Zelda games, and typically, not always, but typically they are only vulnerable from behind, so you have to hit their tail because their front and their midsection is invulnerable. So you want to wait until you have a good opportunity to hit it in the tail, and this will deal harm to it and makes it a little bit shorter. Um, now right after it takes damage and right after it sees you, it will get a burst of speed for a little bit, but then after that it will slow down. Now one quick tip to know about them in general is just if you allow it to see you, it will charge towards you. Now it does just go straight though, so you can actually use this to your advantage by allowing it to um, rush towards you, and if it bonks its head against a wall, it will be stunned for several moments. So use that to your advantage to sneak around and smack it in the tail. There is multiple ways to fight these guys, and I will try to show them throughout this dungeon. Um, so that's one method, is to taunt it into attacking you, and uh, then run out of the way so that it bonks into a wall so it'll be stunned. So that's one method, and that works pretty well. And then just be sure that you're prepared to, like, circle around and hit it in its tail. That's particularly more useful when it's shorter, though, because if it's long still, you have a much longer distance to go. But you can actually use that to your advantage, because even if it is long, you just, like, circle around, and then it has to go forward. It can't go anywhere else. So as soon as it starts traveling again, its tail will come into view after just a moment. So it's not actually a problem if it's still long. So when you crawl out the other exit, you will find a chest containing a small key. Now you can crawl back through that way and that would be fine. Otherwise you can climb the nearby vines and then exit that way. From here, you just go out the nearby door and that's all we had to do here. Now, if you're ever confused in any dungeon about where to go, you can always just use your map. In this case, we have a small key, so we obviously need to find a locked door. So you want to claw shot across the gap here at this bridge, and then this will lead to an area where there is a locked door to the north. So go ahead, go through that door. This will lead to the final area of the fire sanctuary. In this next room, there are several cursed spume as well as a bunch of Bokoblin archers. So I like to take care of them before I do anything else. So you want to use either bombs on the cursed spume nearby or Skyward Strikes honestly would be fine because we're close enough for that. And then otherwise for the Bokoblin archers, I just like to shoot them with arrows. You don't have to. We're going to be up there in just a moment. It's just I don't like uh, having them shoot at me while I'm still trying to mess with the uh, water fruit here. But anyways, I, for a second here, I thought I heard the sound of treasure being dropped. I think it was just those arrows, though. They fell off the ledge and landed in the lava, if you look at the recording. But um, So I was flying up here to see if there was a golden skull or something up here, but there wasn't, so I just canceled. Anyways, what you need to do is just hit the light fruit, or not light fruit, excuse me, that is totally a silent realm term, the water fruit, and this will create a platform so we can get across the lava here. Now, again, the lava is not currently moving, so the platform will disappear after just a moment. 
So up ahead, there are some fire choo-choos. You don't really have to deal with them. You can just run past them, but if they do suck onto you or whatever, just use spin attacks to make them jump off. And uh, up ahead in the next room, there is a single blue Bokoblin that has a monster horn. Now, if you just run forward and use a jump attack on him, that will take care of him right away, and you can get past his defenses that way. But otherwise, I think the best way to take care of them is just to go ahead and steal that monster horn with the whip, because as soon as you do that, their defenses are vulnerable, whatever, for a little bit. So you can get right past their defenses and defeat them almost instantaneously. It's actually quite powerful, but um, you can just about all of the Bokoblins, not all of them, but a lot of the Bokoblins from here on out have monster horns, so it's actually a pretty easy way to take care of them. But yeah, I think a lot of players, like, underestimate how powerful the whip is against Bokoblins. Like, they're always just thinking of it in terms of the monster horns themselves, and it's like, there's the two extremes of people going, Oh yeah, I'm gonna get all the monster horns I can, and then there's the other extreme of people being like, Well, I have all the ones I need, or I just don't care, so I'm not gonna use the whip on them. So they're using other methods to defeat Bokoblins. But it's actually very par powerful, especially against some of the blue ones, or the ones that are a little bit harder and have more health. Um, it's a good way of taking care of them, because like I say, I think most of the Bokoblins at this point have monster horns. Up ahead, you want to dig down into the soft soil location, hit the switch, and this will allow us to initiate this quick little battle, so to speak, with a magma named Platts. Now, he is hiding in here. He's looking for treasure in the fire sanctuary, just like all the other magmas, and he thinks that you're a monster, so he's running away from you. And I think this is definitely a point where a lot of players will struggle with this because they don't quite understand how the mechanics work, but I'll show it real quick. So the trick is two things to know. He runs away as soon as he sees you, and he rotates really slowly if he does, if you're facing directly towards him. So there's both those things you can use to your advantage. It is possible to sneak up on him. Not very easy, though. Instead, wait. You want to lure him into a corner. So here he didn't go up. Instead, I'm going to go down, peek out, let him see me, quickly make a run for the other side. As soon as he sees me, he starts rotating really slowly, and I catch up to him. So you can rewind that and watch again to see how I did that. It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, again, it is possible to sneak up on him, but it doesn't work very well. Um, and actually, I think that the reason Nintendo had that Moldorm fight earlier in this dungeon was actually in part to prepare us for this. Although at the same time, it is kind of the opposite because the Moldorm fight, you're running away from the Moldorm and it's chasing you. And in this one, he's running away from us and we're chasing him. So it is kind of the opposite. Um, but yeah, like I say, getting him to a corner is really the trick. And he doesn't actually go to the far bottom right of that arena at all, where there's a bomb flower. He won't go there because it's a dead end. So um, he'll go everywhere else though. So if you just lead him, lure him over to one of the corners, four corners, then that makes it really easy to take care of him. Um, so once you've finally done so, then he'll realize you're not actually a bad guy at all. And you can then get a chest from him that contains a piece of heart. Now this is of course optional to open this chest. You don't have to, but after um, catching plats like that, this will also move the gate, which allows us to proceed through the sanctuary. Now, if you've been following along with me, this is our piece of heart number 20, which gives us another whole heart container. So up ahead, we have a cursed spume. It's honestly like less of a priority. You can just dodge back and forth. I think the dark keys are a little more of a priority. So you can leave the uh, whip up if you want, as far as a good way to take care of them. And then otherwise you can switch to a different item to take out the cursed spume. But honestly, like I say, you can just weave back and forth. And it is actually definitely close enough that you could use Skyward Strikes and that would work as well. Once they're defeated, you can go ahead and use the nearby water fruit, which will create a platform for you. And the lava here is moving as I was pointing at earlier when I was I was looking at it in passing as I was talking about something else. But anyways, step on the platform, then jump across, and there is a floor switch here that you can step on to create a shortcut back to the earlier portions of the room. So when you're ready to proceed, you want to go ahead and save at the bird statue if you like, and then you want to use the soft soil location that's right next to it. Now this will lead to an underground area where there is a bunch of stamina fruit and a couple rocks that you need to smash through, and then finally a bomb flower that you can push towards the rock that is up to the north. Now this is blocking the flow of lava. Now as soon as you break it, what will happen is it causes a flood of lava, or a lava flow? I don't know what you'd call this. This lava flow that it spreads across the entire screen, which doesn't make any sense. I don't know why that single rock was blocking all that, but anyway, you have more than enough stamina to escape though, so don't worry about it too much. You do need to use up all of it and then make sure you give it time to recharge. But as long as you burst crawl your way out of here, you should have just enough. There is one stamina fruit that's like to the north where you are leaving and you, you can try going towards it, but I don't think you even have enough time to do that at all. I don't think it's possible for you to even do that. So I'm not really sure why they have that particular stamina fruit. Um, but anyways, other than that, you can just ignore everything and just head towards the exit. You have just enough time to make it out of here. All right, so what this does is it makes lava flow out of the the dragon heads, and this causes the lava to flow in that river. So now we can finally use the water fruit that is nearby. So circle around, go down the ramp, use the water fruit, and then this will create a platform that we can then ride to the other side of the room. Huh. 
So at this point, I created a platform and I thought to myself, as long as I was waiting for it, I'd go smack the jars and maybe defeat the uh, cursed spume. But I ran out of time, so I ended up having to recreate my platform. But yeah, there's arrows over here. If you've been following along with me, you should have plenty of arrows, though. Like, honestly, there's a lot of uh, vocal bones here that have arrows, so it's not really a big deal. But anyways, if you end up wasting time like I did, you'll have to recreate the platform. And you can defeat this cursed spume with either Skyward Strikes or use the bow. Now up ahead, this next area, this is the final, like, bridge kind of area of the main room. And there's actually a nearby uh, bird statue. This one you can actually warp to, which is very strange, and I'll talk more about that later, but I should have activated that first. To proceed in the dungeon, what we need to do next is talk to the stone tablet, and it t says that up ahead we've reached the bridge of decision, and you need to choose the path forward. So if you walk over onto the end of this platform, you'll see that it actually pans our camera down, and you can see there are two statues below in the lava. Now, if you remember back at the beginning of the dungeon, there was a magma we met named Gold, and he was talking about two statues that were facing each other, and you need to jump into the mouth of the sleeping statue to open the path forward. So, this, that was a clue about this, and you can actually go back to the entrance, and he's still there, and you can talk with him. But another clue for that, too, is you can look at your map. If you do so, you'll see that in basement one, there is a secret area that is over to the east. Meanwhile, the area to the west has nothing. So, this is a very firm clue that we need to jump into the statue that is to our left. So, jump down, and a platform will appear below you that will catch your fall. My inner cartographer is excited. Um, but yeah, this is just another example of how the how maps in Skyward Sword are actually useful. And I just think that's really cool. Like, a lot of maps in Zelda games are just kind of like, meh. You can just to completely ignore them. They're totally an optional item. I mean, it's optional in this too, but it actually provides hints that are useful. And I just think that's really cool. Like, if you're paying attention and you don't know where to go, your map actually will tell you something. And I think that's really cool. Like, I mean, I guess as opposed to... Cre there's two extremes, I guess. There's creating the map as you go, or there's like a map that just provides useful information that you need to actually complete the dungeon. And uh, this one is a little bit not necessary because we already have another clue. But again, if you don't have that clue or you didn't remember it, you can figure it out based on your map. So there's a goddess wall here, and you can create fairies by drawing a Triforce, which is very useful. It's a lot of healing. Um, but just as a quick thought for you, you don't necessarily have to go ahead and draw on it right now because we're about to enter the next room, which is a mini boss. Um, so before you go ahead and, and uh, like draw something on the goddess wall, you can defeat them first and then come back and create healing. So just, just a quick thought for you. I'm not worried about it, so I'm going to go ahead and just get rupees and then continue onwards. All right, Dark Lazalfos. We actually fought one a few rooms back in the last video, but I didn't have time to talk about it because I was talking about grammar. You know, what is vital information that I can pass on for this battle, and that was grammar, you know? Um, anyways, the thing I really wanted to point out about this battle is something coming up here in a little bit. Is I targeted one Lazalfos, the other one attacked me, and I shield bashed. Like there, boom. And so I was able to defend against an attack from an enemy that I was not targeting. So I just want to point out that shield bashes are actually even more effective when fighting against multiple enemies. Now, I don't really think that's super um, useful against, like, say, Bokoblins, because there's so many of them often. So if there's a whole bunch of them attacking you, I don't think it's as useful. But as long as you're facing the general direction of an enemy that is attacking you and you use a shield bash, I think technically you don't have to be targeted at all. Like, if you're just Z-targeting in thin air and then you, like, walk over towards an enemy and then shield bash, it still works the same way. Uh, but yeah, so if multiple enemies are attacking you, you can totally just shield bash as long as they're kind of roughly in front of you, and it will totally defend. But yeah, Dark Lizalfos, no real difference between them and regular Lizalfos. Um, they will curse you and make you unable to use your sword if they successfully hit you with their flaming attack, or whatever you want to call that, their smoky attack. Um, it does come from their fire breath, I guess, though, whatever you, want, whatever you want to call that. Their smoky curse breath. Their breath is so bad that it curses you. Um, anyways, just run around in circles if that happens until it wears off. This room gives me some serious deja vu of Twilight Princess <laughs> in the very beginning, like, sewer section when we're, like, going up towards Hyrule Castle. Uh, but anyways, um, so what we want to do here is I would recommend you actually kill a lot of the keys in this room. There's a whole bunch of them, and they can get annoying as you're trying to traverse back and forth. Um, now, you can take care of them a variety of different ways. You can't just run all the way up to the top, wait for them to follow you, and then defeat them. Otherwise, you can shoot them with the bow. There's a bunch that are, like, up against ledges and stuff like that. From here, though, what you can do is you can climb up the vines, and there's actually a second set of vines over here at the top left. You grab onto this, and from here... You can grapple on to the opposite side, and there's actually an alcove up here that has a chest. So if you look at your map, you would actually see this one on your map, but it's a little bit vague on its exact location, but here's how you reach it. It just has treasure. It's not really, like, super exciting, but I did just want to show that real quick before you continue onwards. Oh, yeah. Monster horns. <laughs> just what I always wanted, you know? <laughs> at this point, I just I have so many of them. I'm never going to use them all. But anyways, at the bottom, there is also a goddess wall. So you can grab fairies if you want to. Again, I'm full on everything, so I don't need any of that. So I'm just going to get get rupees instead. I'm actually doing pretty good on rupees. I, am, I almost have all the rupees I'm going to need for the rest of the entire game. So I need, like, 800 to get the final piece of heart, and then I also need, like, I don't know, I think 400 or so, whatever, to get... Um, 
all the remaining potions and stuff that I want to purchase. So that I'm actually doing pretty good on rupees. I only need like a thousand three hundred or something like that uh, total. I'm gonna keep gathering rupees, obviously, but uh, I don't need to like go super far out of my way. Yeah, if you ever just totally like ruin your drawing, then instead you'll just get three hearts if it's not sure what you got, I guess. Or so your drawing's just really bad, it'll just give you that instead. Um, the actual recovery heart picture that you can draw will give you something like nine hearts or something like that. I'm actually not sure. I get, the number of hearts that pop out is based on how well you drew the picture. So when you're done collecting stuff, just continue on upwards. And if you're worried about the dark keys at all, you can just switch to the whip and that makes them really easy to take care of as well. Even at a distance, they can just be defeated so you don't have to worry about like waiting for them to get close enough to your sword rather than trying to like dodge out of the way and stuff. Um, it's just a little bit easier that way. So in this room, in order to unlock the boss key, we need to complete a puzzle. And there is a stone tablet nearby that gives you a very obvious clue. It tells you exactly what you need to do. Um, it says that there are these various bird statues up ahead and they have a certain number of wings on them. The number of wings indicates what order you do them in. You want you to do them from least to most. So the first statue has none and that one is required. You have to step through the switch in order to even see anything. Um, and after you step on it, you will see a short cinematic, which kind of gives you an idea on the next location you need to go to. But also you can hold Z on your nunchuck controller and it will show you what's happening above. As always, if you forget the controls, you can always just press 2 on your controller and it'll give you a list of your available options. So the big trick here is just to realize you need to use the bomb flower and throw it across the way and uh, just to give you a shortcut here so you don't step on any other switches. Don't step on the bottom one, instead go to the one in the top right. Um, that is the third one we need to use. So the third one, I realize it only has two wings, which might make it a little bit confusing. Zero is the one you start at and then just work your way to the final one. So that's how you complete this puzzle. It's pretty easy. Again, if you're unsure what to do, just hold down Z so you can see where to go. Um, and I think if you fail, it just starts you over again, like you appear back at the entrance or like they all just go back out again. Um, it's not too hard. Once you've successfully done them all though, this will open up some nearby gratings and you'll have to fight a Moldorm. There's a trick for fighting Moldorms where what you want to do is you want to position yourself so you're ready to attack. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So here I'm going to go up. I'm going to let it see me on purpose. It's going to charge past me. I'm going to go back down. But because I'm still facing up, I can attack its tail. So by pre-orienting like orienting myself for where I'm planning to attack it, I'm able to deal damage to it. And again, just this works really well for letting it charge towards you. So here what I'm doing is I'm going to go to the left, then go back right so that I can attack its tail is what I was trying to do. Did not work out very well, though. So here I'm going to go up again, position myself by going down. So I'm still facing up. So when it goes past me, I can attack its tail again. So this little trick of pre like orienting yourself so you're facing the correct direction. So here again, I was trying to get it to chase me. Uh, it didn't work yet because it's still enraged, but now it's calming down here a little bit. And there we go. So now it's going to chase towards me as soon as the next time it sees me. Uh, this particular area is a little bit awkward, but it doesn't really matter because I'm going to chase after it because it's all short now anyway. So go down, go back up, chase behind it while it's still stunned and defeat it. So that was a very traditional Moldorm fight. Now this was all based on letting it chase after me on purpose. So I was taunting it into attacking. Um, you can sneak up behind it. It doesn't really work super well. Um, I actually think that enraging it on purpose works significantly better. Uh, but yeah, some Moldorms aren't too bad. There is actually a trick to defeating them like super, super easy. Um, this particular arena did not work out that way, but I will show more of those Moldorms la battles later in the, in the walkthrough. You got a key that defies physics! <laughs> like, seriously, what is this thing? It's just a bunch of floating blocks. With that in hand, exit out the door off to the right, and there is a floor switch here you can step on, which will raise the bars that were blocking us from the main room. So this creates a shortcut so we can get back to where we were, and that's awesome. And then meanwhile, there is some jars nearby that you can smack. I think some of them have arrows, and otherwise one of them does have a fairy. So you can grab that in a bottle if you want to. Although we are getting kind of getting to the point where you are you really don't even want fairies at this point. They're just kind of a waste of bottle space because hard potions would be better. I'm still using them both because they're free and I'm like not going to take a lot of damage. I'm not worried about it. So, But I do need to upgrade to Heart Potion Plus Plus soon. So this leads back to the area where we jumped off onto the like statues on either side a little bit ago. But instead, if you turn off to the north instead, you'll see that there is a bird statue here. And this one's actually kind of interesting because it lets you warp to and from here. So you can actually get on your loft wing from here and you can warp down directly here when you travel to Elden, which is very interesting. This is the only dungeon that lets you do this. And I'm not really sure why they decided to do this. Maybe it's because it's just one of the final bosses of the game. And so they thought that, uh, be pretty difficult or something. I'm not opposed to the fact that we can do that. It's just interesting that uh, they decided to make this decision. I actually kind of like that because it feels like not all the dungeons are the same. Like there's just different things about them, um, different quirks about them. And I just think that's really cool. I also think it's really cool that uh, we've had all these boss keys and they're all these weird shapes and stuff like that. And yet we have this one here is actually in the shape of a key itself, which is cool. Like 
I don't know. <laughs> we've had all these different shapes we've been putting in them, and yet this one is actually shaped like a key, and I just think that's super cool. And there's no way you would have known that based on the, uh, this weird shape of just all these mismatched blocks, whatever, you know? But yeah, you can use the bird statue to go back to Skyloft and stock up on items and healing stuff if you want to, or like, switch out shields, whatever you want to do. And then when you're ready, go ahead and open the door and confront the boss. Alright, so here we have the second battle with the Demon Lord, Girihu. Now for the first phase, he works very similar to the first phase of the first time that we fought him, in which he holds his hand out to one side to try and catch your blade. What you need to do is hold your sword in a particular direction, and just wait there for several seconds, and then he will stop moving his hand. After he does that, move your sword to the opposite side, and strike him. So he's totally vulnerable during that time. Now the only thing that's odd about this is that now he has kunai that will steadily charge up, and then they'll attack you after a short time. So what you need to do is alternate between attacking him and then defending against the kunai, and I'd recommend using shield bashes for that. So for the second phase, Girhim now has two swords. Now this is actually very similar to fighting Staffos. It's actually pretty easy. You just slowly, just very carefully choose a direction to attack from, and then use a spin attack, and that gets him through that. His other attacks are primarily using kunai. He'll make them completely surround you. You need to use spin attacks from the correct direction. Now when he does teleport like this, if he looks like he's going to teleport up in the sky, make sure you dodge out of the way, and then he is vulnerable when he stabs back into the ground where he was previously standing. So run away, then run back to him and attack him. 
Once again, Akunai surround you, then use the correct spin attack. If he goes to the middle and teleports, then you need to run away and then run back. Here I did not run fast enough. I should have been dashing with A. Uh, but anyways, so that will, that will... I could have avoided that pretty easily. If he does counterattack you because you hit from the wrong direction, just be prepared to either shield bash or back up with a backflip in particular. Backflips actually make you invulnerable in Skyward Sword for just a split second, so it's actually pretty easy to avoid damage that way. There are like a few attacks and enemies in the game where a backflip is actually the opposite of what you want to do, but it's very, very infrequent, and I'll point out some of those attacks when that happens, especially for the last bosses of the game. Um, but generally speaking, if you're ever unsure what to do, just backflip. If, like, you know, you're unsure if a boss is about to hit you, you're like, ah, it seems a little bit risky, I, like, I can maybe handle it, but just backflip, you'll be safe that way. Just wait for a better opportunity and then attack the boss. So if I were to summarize the instructions on how to defeat this boss, it would simply be this. Spin attacks. Spin attacks for days. And that, my friends, is how you defeat the boss of the Fire Sanctuary. So congratulations, and thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this helpful. Again, as always, if you enjoyed this, be sure to throw a like on this video and subscribe for more content just like this. As always, you guys are awesome. Have an amazing day, and I will see you next time. Well, I guess I could shield surf on this guy. Let's try it. Although this guy does do a whole heart of damage in addition to everything else. Oh, that didn't work. Okay. I must try it. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> it's a suicide.
Let's do it. It'll be great. Ooh. I'm like wasting all the durability on my shield just trying this. <laughs> no! Okay. Nope. <laughs> uh. I, maybe I should include that. Like, here I was trying something ridiculous, did not work. <laughs> Breath of the Wild is a game about skill. Don't do stupid things like this. 